Welcome to another exciting brown bag session. I am Nasra, Leadership Director at Squist, and your host for today's session. It's a beautiful, bright afternoon today. So in today's talk, we will discuss changing how we communicate disease risks and decidedly agree that race is not a risk factor for chronic diseases. I would like to acknowledge that Squist does its work for Canadians from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish and nations. This acknowledgement is a reminder of the discriminatory, racist, and colonial practices that have had a lasting legacy, and it continues to create barriers for indigenous people and communities in our city. So what can we do? So in the next few days, I encourage you to learn a bit more about the land we live on and personalize your connection to the territories on which we settled. And the today's topic, as I told, is that race, race is not a risk factor for chronic diseases. And our speaker is Paula Littlejohn. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Finlay Lab at UBC. Her research focuses on understanding the impact of early life micronutrient deficiency on the gut microbiome and host in the double burden of malnutrition. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biobehavioral Health from the Pennsylvania State University. And she also has a Master's of Science in Social and Behavioral science and health education, and have a graduate certificate in maternal and child health from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please welcome um, Paula, and Paula, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes. And you're just seeing the image here, the title? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sis, for inviting me to do this talk. Um, this is really exciting for me. Um, I want a few disclaimers. I don't actually study race in my current research, um, but I have done a lot of research in uh, African Americans in the United States looking at diabetes and schizophrenia. So I am, and I am also um, from Afro descent. So I am talking from a space of um, a little bit of knowledge. And also this is uh, the data that I'll present here are from other research studies um, published in the literature. And I want to also acknowledge that the, the views point that I'm sharing here today aren't the views of UBC where I am a student, but these are views of my own and from the literature. Okay, so let's begin. So if I were to ask um, the question, how many of you have at some point read in a journal that race was a risk factor for disease or you saw that race was presented as a risk factor? I'm pretty sure a lot of you would probably raise your hand, self-included. Um, and if I asked another question, how many of you actually had believed that? I think many of you who raised your hand would also keep that hand raised and self-included. This was something that I learned when I was doing my master's degree and all the literature that I read pointed to the fact that being of African American descent actually was a risk factor to a lot of chronic diseases. And as we begun to decipher the human genome and um, other genomes such as the epigenome and the microbiome, we have begun to realize that um, this may not necessarily be true. So what is race? So race is a social construct, meaning that it was originally um, designed to categorize people in different groups um, by physical features or certain cultural characteristics. And over time, that has uh, led to uh, race being used for other um, uh, components, such as uh, to disenfranchise certain particular groups. So race is not biological and is actually an imprecise marker for innate biology yet um, we consistently use it. And one of the, okay, I guess it's showing here. Oh, there we go. 
a, a quote that I, I read early this year that I, I really loved um, was that the limitations of using race in biomedicine are important to recognize because race is often afforded more biological value than scientifically justified and less social value than it commands. Yet, we persist on using race as a genetic proxy for health. So what do we learn about the, our sequencing of the human genome, which I mentioned um, previously? Well, we learned that there isn't a gene for race. You know, no matter how we look, how hard we look, we did not find that there is a gene that's specific to any one race. We also found that genetic variation is greater within a particular ethnic group than between them. And this is important to know that. We also learned that the human genome is inherently complex. And we also learned that we could not find a specific or a magic gene that in and of itself causes chronic disease. But we did learn that genes interact with our environment and that interaction is what will lead to diseases. And then we also found that most um, GWAS studies, so these are genome-wide association studies that, follow, um, that followed the Human Genome Project, have come up fairly empty. And so they haven't been able to pinpoint a gene for, um, for race, they haven't been able to pinpoint a specific gene for chronic disease. They have been able to find some genetic associations with disease such as cancer, but when it comes to chronic disease, they haven't been able to find anything that they can pinpoint that this is actually a, a gene related to this. And the other thing, I think a good thing about the Human Genome Project is that it opened up us for us to explore other genomes like the epigenome and the microbiome, which is then enable us to, to study relationships between chronic disease and whether or not they have some kind of relation to um, genetic components or to um, other factors within our body. Another quote that I read recently that I really love is that from this, um, the researcher uh, Rock Kapoor, and he said that although the risk of developing chronic disease are attributed to both genetic and environmental factors, 70 to 90% of disease risk are probably due to differences in environments. Yet, epidemiolo epidemiologists increasingly use genome-wide association studies to investigate diseases while relying on questionnaires to characterize environmental exposure. So there seems to be a mismatch. So when we go through these, these genome-wide studies, although the intention is to look at genetic risk factors, we're actually assessing it by looking at um, administering questionnaires that are asking about risk risk factors that are associated with our environment and with our society. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the talk. So if not race, then what? There seems to be a clustering of disease in certain racial and ethnic group. So what exactly is going on? What's, what's, what's causing this issue? So it turns out when we look at chronic diseases, um, and you see there's a list of chronic disease here. So we have heart disease, stroke, and in short, most of you are aware of this, um, COPD, diabetes, and cancer. These are the, the top um, five main chronic diseases that we generally study or, or look at in, in medical research. And the risk factors that we often associate with these are poor diet, physical inactivity, excessive alcohol use, tobacco smoke, and then race is often presented in a journal more as like an, it carries an elevated risk factor. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about today. But I, and I also want to argue that race isn't a risk factor for disease, but I will talk later on what we should actually be considering when we look at risk factors for chronic disease. So again, when you look at the United States and in Canada, you see that, um, you know, with this clustering of disease, but it's not really um, equal. And so what we're looking at is that there's, what we found is that structural racism actually is considered to be pathogenic and that structural racism in the healthcare system may be uh, at play at causing health diseases. And um, indeed, what we've seen recently is that been an outcry from several different medical associations, the American Medical Association, the United States, um, the American um, Physician Association and several other physician groups have been putting out these statements. And this one from um, AMA came out in November. Um, this is a, a later journal, but it came out in November 16th saying that uh, racism is actually considered a public health threat. And so, and, and several other groups have been talking about systematic racism, 
systemic racism, sorry, and the health disparities and that racism is actually at the cause of these chronic diseases that we're seeing in African Americans in the United States and not necessarily their race. And so if you, um, before you get too comfortable thinking that this is just in the United States, I want to point out that also in Canada, they have been reporting the same thing that in the Canadian healthcare system, um, it isn't immune to racism and that there is a call, there's been a call to end racism in the healthcare systems. And there's been documented evidence uh, throughout Canadian history on the fact that racism in the healthcare system um, causes, leads to health disparities. And just in case you want to think that maybe Canada just jumped on the bandwagon for what has happened in the United States over the summer, just to point out to you that these are studies that were published um, two to three years ago, looking again at um, racism in the healthcare system in Canada. So this is something that is pervasive. It is something that is here. It is not just the United States, but it is something that is real and something that's been um, in getting more attention lately that this uh, racism or structural racism that exists in our healthcare system is actually detrimental to um, racialized groups. So what exactly is structural racism? So I have two definitions here and I have two because I, I, I really like them. Uh, so the first is from Kamara Phyllis Jones at Harvard and she uh, previously worked at the CDC, has done some phenomenal work in structural racism. And if you really wanna learn more about this topic, I highly recommend you watching some of her YouTube videos, reading some of her papers. She's had some, some really phenomenal publications on this topic and continues to do so. So structural racism, based on her definition, is a system of structured opportunities and assigning value based on the social interpretation of, one, of how one looks, which unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages others, other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through a waste of human resources. And this is really uh, amazing the way that she said this, because not just to, for us to look at how it advantages one group, but how it, it also disadvantages one group. And in that, it, it, and, and overall, it saps our human resources because if we have more unhealthy or we're creating more unhealthy people in our population, that affects the entire society as a whole. It doesn't just stay within one group, it affects the whole, the entire community. Another definition by Powell is that structural racism is the macro level systems, social forces, institution, ideologies, and processes that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. And I really just want you to, to appreciate and see that the structural racism, it's, it's, it's a huge monster, really, um, and, and something that we need to deal with because of the impact that it has on health. So how does structural racism influence chronic disease? Well, structural racism then leads to actually have been shown to induce or elicit a physiological response, with, which then equals poor health or disease. And I want to talk about in the next few slides, uh, just a few studies that have been published looking exactly at structural racism and chronic disease relationship and how, so we can have a better understanding of how um, it might impact the health of African Americans. So um, just talking about stress, um, structural racism and chronic disease and looking at stress. So there are two, a lot of papers published, but I just highlighted two here because I don't have uh, all day to talk about this. But um, it, these, one of the things I wanted to mention is that structural racism is considered a stressor in itself that elicits a physiological and neuroendocrinological response. And an increased stress in response to racism is linked to um, hypertension and cardiovascular disease risk. And this is based on some work that has been done out of the Jackson Heart Study. The Jackson Heart Study is a study that's been in Jackson, Mississippi that started in 2000 and will continue till uh, 2024. So this is a longitudinal study with 5,000, uh, a little bit over 5,000 African-American male and female. And um, researchers, they've had three visits so far to date, and they've been just looking at, the, the, the goal of the study is to look at genes and environmental risk factors for cardiovascular disease in African Americans. And uh, the impetus for the study is because in the Southern United States, African Americans are disproportionately affected by um, chronic diseases and actually have increased morbidity and mortality from chronic diseases compared to uh, um, African Americans in, in the northern part, or other parts of the United States. So this is really a crucial study. 
Um, and it is thought, it's thought that racism is thought to represent a noxious type of chronic stress that is linked to a range of adverse health outcomes. And this has been shown in multiple studies. So in this first study in the discrimination and hypertension risk among African Americans, what they looked at was they measured using a, a validated scale, they measured everyday and um, lifetime exposure to racism, or racial discrimination. And, and then they looked at a sample of 1,845 patients. And what they found was that um, these patients who didn't have hypertension coming into the study in 2000, by year eight, 52% had hypertension. And although they didn't find an association between everyday um, exposure to racism and no dose response, they did find though that participants who experienced one or more domains of lifetime discrimination had higher incidence of hypertension even after adjusting for age. And that higher stress from lifetime discrimination was associated with higher risk of hypertension even after adjusting for age, gender, and socioeconomic status. And then another study um, using the Jackson cohort looked at racism and cardiovascular disease, and they found the same thing, looking at the same measure, looking at lifetime exposure, uh, um, everyday and everyday exposure. They did find association between both everyday exposure and lifetime exposure, and that both had a significant um, increased incidence or, or related to association with um, increased incidence of cardiovascular disease in African Americans. So looking at another marker um, that has been studied has been uh, inflammation. And I'm sure I don't have to convince many of you in the audience out there that inflammation is, has been shown to be linked uh, to chronic disease. And this has been well established in the journals. And several studies have also found that racism is considered a chronic stressor that triggers chronic high levels of inflammation. And so in this particular study, they look at um, self-report experiences of everyday discrimination, and they also measured um, a, a marker for inflammation, C-reactive protein, known as CRP, um, in African-Americans in these groups. And what they found was that um, participants who experienced both everyday and lifetime uh, discrimination had severely higher um, uh, levels of C-reactive protein in their blood. So, you know, indicating that the stress from racism actually had a physiological or cellular response, increased inflammation that you could actually measure in the blood. Um, and this inflammation then will, will be what triggers or leads to chronic disease. Another aspect that um, also showed up in literature, at least that I was particularly interested in, was looking at epigenetics. And so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with epigenetics, but so epi epigenetics is basically a change in gene expression without altering the underlying DNA. And so it's literally just like a tag. If you think about a, a, use a book um, and then you just use some sticky notes and then you can attach to the different sides of the book, that's kind of what epigenetic does. It doesn't change the altering chapters in the book, but it just adds like little tags or little sticky notes on those. And then these sticky notes can actually be passed on to generation. The other interesting fact about epigenetic changes or tags is that they are often almost always environmentally triggered. So our environmental exposure, um, and this has been well studied, stress, um, our interactions, the diet, these can all put different tags on our epigenome that can then be passed on to our offspring. And this is really crucial. And I, I like that they've begun, begun to look at this in the literature because we have seen that early life exposure, there's this, this critical window for, for when we develop and how we are, um, we are, uh, our, our health trajectory is set from birth. And, and in this early stages and these epigenetic markers, if you're thinking about racism in the United States, you're looking at hundreds of years of having this environmental um, high risk exposure that's been put in these tags on African Americans. And so I'm really interested to, to see the results of, of some of these studies as they begin to unfold, because you're looking at generational effects that have definitely affected African Americans that's then been passed on to their offspring, thereby increasing their, their exposure to certain type of disease or their risk factor or predisposition predisposing them to, to certain disease. So not based necessarily on that they have a gene, but that there's been alteration caused by the environment that then causes them to be more at risk 
And so these are two studies that have just been um, presented in different theoretical framework, looking at how epigenetics may play a role in um, African Americans and in passing on those 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 um, traits to their offspring. And they've been really the, these two papers are really great because they just highlight some different epigenetic models that one can use to begin to decipher how these things can get under the skin to then cause disease in African Americans. The last um, type of study that I want to talk about is looking at race and the microbiome. And the microbiome is, is a fairly new player um, in the game. And so we've only just begun really trying to understand uh, our gut microbiome. This is the area that I study. And I found this paper and it was really interesting because this was a different type of, of paper. So it didn't necessarily look at structural racism, but what they did find in this study was that um, they found a difference in beta diversity. And so beta diversity is the difference in the gut microbiome structure between individuals versus alpha diversity, which is within the same individual. They didn't find that. Um, and then they found that out of the 10 genre of bacteria they were looking at, they found one strain to be associated with um, race. Now, um, I, I bring this study up because um, what I mentioned at the, the talk when I asked if you have had a, ever read in a paper where race was presented as an elevated risk or a risk factor for chronic disease. And this is certainly um, one of those papers that I think would, would fit that criteria in that they just looked at the difference between races uh, in, in ethnicity between blacks and white and just said, well, it's because uh, they're black that they have this bacteria and they have this difference between them. However, if you look more at the study, um, at the methods, you would see that the, the African-American participants in the study had higher rates of BMI. So that means they have higher rates of obesity. Obesity also changes the gut microbiota, make it more dysbi dysbiotic. And we also see higher rates of certain bacteria in, um, in obese individuals. They also didn't control or um, didn't measure uh, any underlying comorbidities. And so type two diabetes, hypertension have all been shown to alter the gut microbiota composition. And that was not mentioned here. They only looked at, they only excluded participants who were taking antibiotics, which can uh, alter the gut microbiota, but so can other uh, medication. And they didn't control for that. And so this is, again, we have to be careful when we begin to present these information and pre present these studies, uh, looking at race as a biological risk factor for certain disease, when actually it could be something else. It could be the diet, it could be all these different things that influence the microbiome that's going on here because the microbiome is very sensitive to our environment, it's very sensitive to stress, it's very sensitive to the type of diet that we eat. And the only thing that they control for was the amount of fat um, from calories and the amount of fiber and they just did a 24 hour recall. So not even considering uh, what might've been happening um, over that time to have shaped the microbiome. And indeed, another study that has been published looked at, um, and this researcher um, in, in Israel from the Weizerman Institute, uh, Dr. Iran Elenov has looked at the gut microbiome in, in several aspects. He's looked at all the twin studies that have been published and he's published a lot on this. And what he's found and, and um, published recently was that environment dominates over host genetics in shaping our gut microbiome. And so then if you look at this previous study where they're just talking about race, really, if they had spent a little bit more time to look at some of this, the, the literature, they would have, been, would have found that there isn't actually a gene that's been shown to, to shape the gut microbiome, and therefore we can't link it to a certain race. So I wanted to go back to this again. So when we think about risk factors for chronic disease, I think what we really need to do is to talk about structural racism. That structural racism actually is a risk factor, that racism is actually pathogenic and that it can influence the disease that um, African-Americans um, and other groups as well. I, I, there, there are literature out there looking at indigenous population, looking at South Asians, um, when they migrate for, um, from to the to United States or Canada, you see a shift in their disease 
rates and so and and, and most of it's attributed to structural racism or the access or, or lack of access to health care that they have here so this is you know and in the uk so this has been well studied that structural racism actually impacts health so how do we begin to address it um, and I really like quotes. I, I write a lot of quotes and so this is why you see them in my talk. And so racism is a structural, it is structural, having been codified co or codified in our institutions of customs, practice, and, um, and law. And so there is no need for an, identify, an identifiable perpetrator, meaning that if you see, if you ask someone if they're racist, they'll deny it and say, well, no, I'm not a racist um, for the most part. And hopefully they'll, they'll say that. But we have to come away from looking at an individual and understand that it is a system. And if it's a system, then there are laws, there are structures, there are different codes um, that play, play a role in, in structural racism. And so you have to address it differently. We need to recognize that it exists and that it is a problem. And then we need to become aware of our own implicit and explicit bias. And again, mentioning that study that I talked about with the microbiome, looking at some implicit biases that may have fed into this researcher's um, thought or uh, of going into how they presented this research or how they investigated or set up their, their experimental measures and their methods. So, I pulled this from um, the CDC in the United States. Um, and one of the things when I first pulled it, it was just to talk about, you know, the, how the different types of chronic disease. But as I looked at it again, I thought, okay, so looking at our implicit biases that may play a role in how we perpetuate that Afri being of African-American descent actually plays a role in chronic disease. So here you have this a black male with diabetes. And even though it shows that he's physically active, Again, he's listed under diabetes, so you're making this association that even if he exercises, he's still going to be at high risk for diabetes because somehow it's related to his race. And then when you look at um, the risk factors that were presented in the CDC, again, you see this poor nutrition and you see it with um, African American, you see tobacco use again with, with a black youth, um, and you see here with um, alcohol. Sorry, this is covered. I meant to take that out. Let me go back. Sorry, with alcohol, that there's this definitely a, a non white person here. And then when you zoom in, you saw again this non white person being presented to have excessive alcohol use. Again, reinforcing these stereotypes in health that, that there must be some kind of genetic um, risk factor that's playing a role for people of different ethnic groups that might be uh, feeding into their disease risk. So you might ask, you might say, well, Paula, maybe they were just trying to show a very diverse profile. And, you know, so people, when they visit the website, they can feel represented there. Yes, true. But they can also do some other things. So these are um, infographics made for, by the CDC. And this is predominantly how, no, sorry, the WHO, how the WHO, World Health Organization, present their disease. And so they use just these very these stick figures and graphics so that it's not associated with uh, a particular racial group. And so you don't have to navigate through that. You don't have to, to, to you know, try to identify or, or validate or invalidate why your particular racial or ethnic group is, is listed in a certain area. And this just gives you the information. And so you just come away with the information versus being, having to wrestle with the nuances of, of race and ethnicity. This is another um, infographic showing to the same, uh, looking at the same data, looking at chronic disease, both in Canada and the United States. And you see here in Canada, again, they just use stick figures. They presented the same information. They list the type of chronic disease that you see here, where the United States, totally different. While here, they were trying to, maybe they were just trying to show that, you know, the diversity of their population, but then again, here now you have these different hand colors associated with linked to certain diseases so now as a person coming on here a person of color you have to then wrestle with and navigate um this like the suggestion that's being made here like am i more at risk for cancer am i more at risk of this because you know there is a, a black hand here whereas simply just presenting the same information as they did here in a canadian infographic takes away from that so we just really need to be careful about these implicit biases that we put out there where we're presenting health information 
because there's already so much stacked against us and we, and we need to be careful of that. So what are some of the takeaways that I would, hopefully that you got from this talk? Is that race cannot be biologically defined due to genetic variation among humans. Racial discrimination, specifically structural and personal, racism is an environmental stressor. And a chronic exposure to stress from racial discrimination has physiological consequences. And that there's growing evidence um, demonstrating that structural racism and perceived racism and everyday and lifetime exposure to racial discrimination is associated with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and triggers inflammation at the cellular level in African Americans. Also that racism may have transgenerational effects through um, epigenome and through epigenetic changes that can be passed on to their offspring. And these are induced during critical periods of development in the offspring. And that racism in healthcare is a structural problem and there and thus must be addressed on multiple levels. And that race is not a biological risk factor to chronic disease. However, racism is pathogenic. So then what can you do? Well, we can stop perpetuating the myth that race is a risk factor and do the hard work to determine the true cause. When you're in a conversation with someone and they make a statement, you can actually say, I'm not necessarily sure. I think there, even if you don't know all the science that is out there, you can definitely say, I'm not sure if that's true. Um, I don't think race is biological. Maybe there are other factors that are playing a role. Shift, we need to make a shift from race to racism when looking at health disparities. We need to, and you need to challenge yourself and your colleagues, for those of you working in science, to look at structural race, structural system that may be impacting uh, the particular health condition that you are studying and report on that in your publication. Don't just take the lazy route and just say, well, there's a difference because they're black or white or they're indigenous or they're Asian actually look at what are some of the underlying factors that may be contributing to the particular condition that you're studying. Advocate for literature change. If you happen to volunteer as a, a reviewer, challenge the author, uh, you know, did you actually measure this? Are you missing something? Can this be viewed some other way? What are some factors that you, you probably didn't consider and maybe add that into your limitations of your study and not, or maybe change the title so it's not so suggestive, but more like uh, exploratory. Understand the role of intergenerational impact of racism on the epigenome and advocate for funding programs that can impact maternal and child health. This is a critical window for epigenetic changes and imprinting. And so if we have more funding to, to, to look at that, and African-Americans are, have, are disproportionately affected by um, death in, um, in delivery than any other groups in the United States. And so this is a big problem. We need to critically think about how we design our studies. And if you're looking at genetic influence, don't collect data on environmental exposures only. You need to actually find the funding or if you don't have the funding to to sequence dna and to, to look at that then maybe you need to change the approach of your study disrupt the system on multiple levels structural racism is huge it affects our healthcare system it, it affects our judicial system um our, our educational system and so we need to to disrupt it at multiple levels and include more people of color in your studies i've worked 10 years in clinical research and a couple of the years in, in academic research in my academic research i was at johns hopkins and so we did look at uh, a lot of different groups and we looked at uh, african americans during in those trials but in my 10 years in clinical research I, I could probably count on both hands or maybe one how many african americans were actually included in those trials yet they are also people who are going to be taking this medication. And although there, there's not a, a biological difference, but they should be represented in the studies. And then become active. Inaction actually perpetuates the existence of racism. And so I want to leave you with one final quote. And is that in the biomedical community, or the biomedical community is privileged to have the opportunity to tackle discrimination in research and medicine and to turn away from cultures of underrepresentation and implicit bias that reinforce racial stereotypes and exacerbate health disparities. So with that, 
I want to say thank you and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for so much information. And personally, I think I realized that I really need to be educated on this topic. You talk about many diseases, but I was wondering some diseases which are directly connected with skin, like eczema, cancer, or other skin diseases, are they connected with um, genetic, with race or not? So for, uh, for sure, some cancers um, do show a genetic risk factor, although it's, it's not as high as people often think um, or that we give it that much weight to. Um, when it comes to um, skin conditions, there are multiple um, factors at play. The gut microbiome actually also influences um, diseases on the skin, and we have a microbiome on our skin as well. And so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily attribute um, eczema to genetic. I would investigate um, other areas or that researchers are looking at, whether they're looking at microbiome on the skin and looking at the shift and dysbiosis that might be happening in the skin microbiota, and also look at the gut. And there are some research that shows that um, when they give people like a huge amount of, of, of carrots and then they'll see their skin actually turn orange, indicating that there's a connection between the gut and the skin. Okay, thank you. So actually this information is uh, kind of complex new and yeah so maybe we would need your slides so we can share it with audience and they can read it again and, um, and like explore more yeah definitely i'm happy to do that and happy to discuss offline as well if anyone has any other questions i didn't get a lot into my own research um, we studied the microbiome but it is uh has been shown to be a key player in chronic diseases and so we definitely need to to begin to look at um other factors that may be at play and and come away from just the way that someone looks that you know that's influenced in our disease status because it, it's not necessarily the case and when we look at inequities in healthcare and look at access and the barriers to healthcare, who gets treated, who doesn't, who don't get treated, um, we see a, a lot of um, some, some changes there. When for, um, there's a study I was reading where they show that in, in 1964, when they, the United States became desegregated, that death from maternal, from, from um, birth or, or in African-Americans decreased significantly over six years um, because of just that they had access now that they were able to be to be able to come in and have their babies and even though right now still i think there was a number and i saw it was like 243 percent it's like a huge rate of african americans who die in childbirth in the united states and it's attributed to how they're treated in the healthcare system and when you look at indigenous group here in the united states again um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Sinclair case where it was um, a young man in a wheelchair was in a hospital and he was there for 34 hours and he was ignored by everyone in the hospital. The nurses, they showed video footage of everyone just passing by and he died from a simple treatable condition, which was just he had a, a, a bladder infection. And um, so the structure of racism does play a role in our healthcare system, the way that things are coded, the way that um, some treatments are covered. There are some biases in our physicians. Um, many physicians, I don't think are necessarily racist, but I think there are some implicit bias that plays a role in how they treat their patients. Am I gonna give this patient this? Will they follow this regimen? They kind of wrestle with those thoughts and it influences how um, they administer care. Nastana, there are actually okay. questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, there's a question. Yes. About um, so I'll just read one oh, from Wes. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So Wes is a question. Is there evidence for differences in drug metabolism or P450 enzymes between race, or is this connected to racism? Right, so um, P450 enzyme, which um, is our detoxification genes. So you're probably asking that because you've seen a couple um, studies being published about SNPs and looking at cytochrome P450 and the, different, the differences in people. Um, I haven't seen anything where that's been attributed to a specific racial group. Um, when you look at the human genome, what you find is that we're genetically similar, then we are different. 
and that actually the the most similarities or differences that you will see is actually within a, a particular ethnic group versus outside. And SNPs actually represent about 1% of the population. They can happen at any time, that anything can cause them. And so um, I haven't seen anything to suggest that there is a genetic component to some of these genetic gene mutation that we see like in detoxification or um, MTFHR and, and some of those other um, genes. And I think okay. there's so Thank you, Paula. So yes. there's another question uh, from Olga. She says, I am Eastern European and have been told by a specialist, well, you know, people from your background have one out of 400 chances of having this disorder. Any suggestions to how to reply a challenge like this? Yeah, I think you should ask for the data. <laughs> Say, can you point um, out those the research studies that have been done on this group that I can look at because sometimes when people are talking about um, we're race we're really talking about ancestry and we're talking about geographical location and so when you're looking at uh, people from a certain geographical location there are some influences there but they, they dilute over time um, and you know as you, you move through different populations you move to different societies you will definitely see shifts that's happening there um, if this is, there are some rare diseases that do have genetic component. I won't, you know, dispute that. And if this is a rare condition that has that, then yeah, you want to look at that. But if this is something that teaches kind of a jargon, then I would ask to, for some follow-up. I would ask for some more data to, to show you that that's actually the case. And you do, you do need to have discussions with your, your physicians. Don't be afraid to do that. I had a, a, a visit with one doctor and I definitely felt a little bit of microaggression where he was like talking to me from across the room. And what I did was I asked him, where did he practice? And immediately, as soon as I did that, he straightened up and then he got closer because he recognized that I was now challenging him versus him just kind of trying to um, push me off by saying like, you know, it was just it was very awkward space that he didn't want to like touch my child or anything like that but when i began to just question him and uh where did you practice what did you practice what did you study and all this thing then it, it made him you know kind of come to himself a little bit so have those discussions with your with your doctor you know to say um i'm noticing that you know when we we have this discussion or when i come into your office there's something there it, can we talk about this you know, don't be afraid. It is your health and you have to be invested in it as well. Okay, so another question Krista asked. So how do you feel about sickle cell anemia being taught as an evolutionary defense to malaria that gets tied up as a justification for racial differences in disease? Yeah, sickle cell is, is um, definitely very tricky. Um, and I, I do believe there probably is some um ancestry that's playing a role there um i don't know all the data on sickle cell but i think it, it, it is some there but i think we we definitely have to get away from the fact that it's just a, a black thing i think if we look at other people from that, that that area can we find the same thing so again it's just knowing the literature and being able to ask those questions and to look at it and what what's actually influencing that is it some of these um, exposure, the environmental exposure that has been um, epigenetically passed down through time that's actually playing a role here that we just have missed or we just have not studied because we didn't have the tools before where now we do? Is that part of the, the situation that we just don't know yet? So, but yeah, sickle cell is, is definitely an interesting one. Okay, so uh, Apurva, she asks, I know you mentioned that people tend to measure race through a questionnaire, which isn't enough. If people were truly to measure a genetic component, what would they have to do? Would this be about sequencing the genome and identifying the gene, uh, gene versus common genes that pro produce the disease? Yes, so I think um, if we need to change the word from race to ethnicity, because then when you start talking about ethnicity, then you can capture um, broader components like geographical location, um, what type of groups they're mixed in. I'm originally from Jamaica. I just got my DNA sequence the other day and found that I have 70% Nigerian genes. I have um, Scandinavian genes. <laughs> so 
it's 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 a big mix so no one is just genetically just one thing and so we need to ask those questions to begin to say okay where's your ethnic um, affiliation or group where are you from so begin to ask those answers to questions and then the other part um would this be about sequencing the genome if you're asking gene questions, then yes, you need to look at the, the genes. You need to look at the genome. You can't ask genetic questions and look at an environment and then make those decisions. You really need to look at, if you're looking at the genes and the environmental interaction, then you collect data on both, but you can't collect data on one thing and then associate it with something else that you have not looked at. And it's the same that we do in microbiome research. It's very complex. Um, it's very difficult to find one bacteria or commensal bacteria that's causing a certain disease. And so we look at the community. What's going on in the community? What's the interaction that's happening here versus trying to find one bad guy or one bad bug? Okay. Yes, so Karen asked that you mentioned some clinical study do not take in account different races, black, and indigenous, et cetera. It's shocking. This means some medications may not be effective on certain populations and they will be prescribed. And the cost to the public health, how is it linked with the actual problematic COVID-19? COVID-19 is a big one because um, there's been a push with COVID-19 to include a lot of different um, ethnic groups um, in the trials. And, you know, I think Fauci, Dr. Fauci in the United States, when he made a statement in April of 2020 that Blacks were, you know, more effective by COVID, which was the wrong move because immediately you saw every group was like, oh, well, let me go outside then. I don't want to be locked down. It's not affecting me. It's just affecting Black people. That means it's a Black thing. They're more susceptible. So it causes a lot of problems in a, on a public health scale. One, you, you give this false sense that everyone else is off the hook. And so people begin to um, behave in, or have unsafe behavior like and exposing themselves to a risk factor that is actually not biological. So that's the first thing. Um, and then, yeah, in, in a lot of these studies, because we don't know um, whether or not ancestry plays a role, but just different, just people, just how they eat, how they live, the environment that they interact with is going to, to change how they metabolize certain drugs. If, if you have one group that has a high amount of stress um, from discrimination, that's going to affect their cortisol levels. They're going to affect other hormones. It's going to reshape their gut microbiome. It's going to shape so many factors that are going to affect how that drug is metabolized. And in clinical research, unfortunately, we, we just don't do that. And it, it even started when clinical research trials first started, they were predominantly done on white males. And of course, male and females are very different. <laughs> the way our body is structured, the fat tissues, everything that we have and, and plays a role in how we metabolize drugs. And that was the way it was for a very long time until they realized that that was very, that was dangerous. And so I think we're, we're, we have the same thing here. We just need to include other people in these studies when we do them. I think it's, it's ethical and it's the right thing to do so that we can have a better understanding to see if there is a difference, maybe just how people live, um, their, their lived experience, their diet, and, and how they interact with their environment that may affect how these different drugs are metabolized. It's a very good question. COVID-19 is a big one. I think we'll see in the next couple of, <laughs> when the vaccine actually comes out, um, we'll definitely see how people respond to that. Okay, so thank you, Paula. So uh, we were planning to have a breakout rooms uh, to get a chance to debrief, but uh, there were so many questions, so we are uh, skipping that. And before we close, uh, I have a few messages. So uh, you will be getting a um, survey evaluation form. Please fill up that because we love to have your feedback and we want to improve our quiz. And the other message is that we are going to have another brown bag event next week on uh, next week, Wednesday, December 9. So please stay tuned for joining lovely Lorraine Graves. And Lorraine will be talking about uh, plain language skills, and we will be learning with Lorraine how to kiss means how we can keep our language simple, silly, yet enthusiastic. 
And thank you very much, uh, Paula. And, and one last thing, last but not least, that we, uh, Paula celebrated her, her birthday yesterday. So let's sing a song together to Paula. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can I mute yourselves, please? And uh, all right. Ask all to unmute. And yes, please. You go ahead, Nasira, and lead the song. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paula. Happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you so much. And I would definitely love that cake. You know, like the, the genome, the DNA on there. That's so scientific and I love it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was fun. I had a fun birthday. Very special. Um, COVID style. Didn't go anywhere, but it was fun. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And I'm really enjoying being a part of this. I'm a new member. Just joined in August, I think. And I've been really active so far and I'm enjoying my time here being a member. Thank you.